Welcome back to part four of our series on how Jesus has conquered your sin. In the previous three parts, we have seen what sin is and how it goes deeper than outward actions. We also saw how Jesus changes our spiritual identity through his sacrifice and the indwelling of his spirit. Then last week, we also saw how the Holy Spirit convinces us of our righteousness in Christ, confirming the status of our cleansed conscience, and that in Christ, our conscience is free from the guilt, shame, and condemnation of our old identity and rightly focused on Jesus Christ. Now today, we will be focusing on the most crucial aspect of Jesus conquering sin, the salvation, and what it means from a practical standpoint of daily life. Hi, I'm Jim. I'd like to welcome you to Thriving Branch today as we continue looking at how Jesus has conquered our sin. This is part four of a continuing series where we've seen a lot of interesting things so far regarding sin, regarding our new identity in Christ, and regarding the cleansing of our conscience. And today, as I mentioned in the opening, we will be looking at salvation and what it means from a practical standpoint regarding the conquering of sin by Jesus Christ. And to begin this kind of a discussion, we have to start with definitions. What is salvation? What does salvation even mean? You see, the word salvation gets bantered around a lot among believers, but its full meaning is often ignored. Much like the word peace, which we've studied previously, salvation has a rich meaning in both Hebrew and Greek. Salvation in Greek is soteria. It's a very rich word with a meaning that includes deliverance, preservation, protection, and provision. And likewise, salvation in Hebrew is actually Yeshua. And it is an affluent word, as much so as it is in Greek including within it such things as deliverance and welfare and protection and prosperity. And let me ask you this question right from the start. Do you typically associate those blessings with salvation? Do you typically associate the word salvation with prosperity and welfare and deliverance and protection? See, we often relegate those kinds of things, such as safety and security, especially protection and prosperity, off into the distance. But as we understand the word salvation, we can begin to see that there is truly no separation between one and the other. All of those blessings are included in the ultimate master blessing of salvation. So we can see that salvation is a very big, full word with a large scope and a vast meaning. And therefore, when we consider the typical Christian admission of Jesus has saved me, we can begin to see this phrase means a lot more than what we usually think it to mean. It's easy to become stuck in the mindset of thinking that salvation is only rescuing us from hell after death. But by taking that view, 
we rob ourselves of the plethora of blessings that Jesus has made available to us. So how do we receive those blessings? How do we receive salvation? Since salvation is so rich and so meaningful and so necessary for eternal life, it's also crucial to understand how to receive salvation. There are many theories and many ideas regarding how to receive salvation, including various works and sacrifices that you have to do, and sometimes even random chance. See, men have a lot of ideas about how to receive salvation. You may believe that God will choose some and reject others, or you have to go through this trial to receive salvation, or you have to do these works over here to receive salvation. But what do the scriptures actually tell us? Most people instinctively think of John chapter 3, verse 16, when the topic of salvation comes up, but we don't even need to go that far into the book of John. John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, tells us how to receive salvation. Verse 12 and 13 of John chapter 1, read this with me. Ready? One, two, read. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And these verses tell us a few things. The first of which is that those who believe on his name those who believe on his name are given power to become sons of God. And as verse 13 continues, these people are reborn, not of blood, flesh, or the will of mankind, but of God. So what does it mean to believe on his name? It's easy to quickly read past that without actually considering it. But it says that all those who believe on his name are given power to become sons of God. So what does it mean to believe on his name? Believing on Jesus' name does not simply mean to believe that Jesus exists. Indeed, there are many who believe that Jesus exists, including evil spirits. They believe and they tremble. But there's more to believing on his name than simply recognizing his existence. Believing on Jesus' name is also not focused on the Old Covenant Law or the Law of Moses. It's not focused on regulations or church traditions. And we can actually see this in John chapter 8 verses 23 and 24, when Jesus has a conversation with some Pharisees. So turn over to John chapter 8, verses 23 and 24, and read those with me now. Ready? One, two, read. And he said to them, You are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Now take notice of some 
vital details here that Jesus mentions in these verses. Jesus said that you'll die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. That's an interesting phrase. He did not say, unless you work hard or try your best to keep the law of Moses, you'll die in your sins. He didn't say, if you perform these works over here, you'll die in your sins. He didn't say, if you get picked randomly, you'll die in your sins. No, he said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. What is this he that Jesus is talking about? What does it mean to believe that Jesus is he? Well, if we examine the context, we'll find out that he is talking about, unless you believe I am the Christ, which is a title. Christ is not Jesus' last name. It is a title of the Anointed One, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the one who comes and saves and redeems. You see, the truth of Christ is not a truth about works that you perform, laws you have to do, merit of yourself, but it is the truth of Jesus as the Savior, the Mashiach, the one who comes down from heaven to save those who are lost and dying and to give all those who believe on him eternal life. But it doesn't mean much unless you make it personal. This is a personal decision for a personal relationship with a personal God. You have to make it personal. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am he, meaning that Jesus is the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Savior sent from God, down to earth for the specific purpose of redemption. Many of us understand this on a grand scale of collective humanity. Jesus came down to save the world. But what does that mean on a personal level? What does it mean for you right now? What does believing that Jesus is your Savior mean for you? This is one of the main points that Jesus makes within the same chapter. If you jump down to verses 31 and 32 of John chapter 8, you will read this. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice what Jesus says here. In verse 31, we see the small little word, on. Believe on him. They believed on him. That's different than believing in him. To believe in Jesus is to simply believe that he exists, like we discussed earlier. But to believe on Jesus is to make him your foundation. Like if I was to say to you, this camera is standing on this table. This glass of water is on this table. You are standing on that ground or sitting on that chair. When you believe on Jesus, you are making him your foundation. He is the one that's supporting you. He is the one upholding you. 
He is the one you are trusting on for everything, knowing that you are safe and secure, being held up by his hands, and you are firmly rooted and grounded on him. That is what it means to believe on Jesus versus simply believing in him that he exists. This is one reason why Jesus said in verse 31, If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. Continuing in his word means to hold on to the truth of what he accomplished on the cross for you. To exist in that truth. To live your very life around that truth. To be embraced by that truth. Jesus has worked a complete and finished work for your entire life. And everything you could ever need is supplied by him as your provider. This is what it means to believe that Jesus is actually supporting you. And understanding that Jesus actually is salvation. See, we can see that salvation is entirely wrapped up in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And through him is how salvation comes. Salvation is not primarily a grand collective act, but it's a personal transaction by which all your sin is laid upon Jesus and all his righteousness is laid upon you. And you become a new creation, born again by the Spirit and the power of God. Believing in Jesus is the method of entering into that salvation and how you receive that salvation. There's a lot more for us to see here regarding this, and I invite you to join me again next week for the final part of our discussion on how Jesus conquered our sin as we explore how the salvation of Christ frees us completely from sin through his grace and through his finished work and how to apply this even more to our daily life. I look forward to seeing you again next week as we both see more of Jesus. Be blessed. Thank you for joining me for today's Bible study. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and share it with others. And be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so that you never miss a video. I also invite you to check out thrivingbranch.com where you'll find a lot more information and resources on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'd also like to let you know that you can help support me in this ministry through your prayers, your sharing of the information with others, and through your financial giving as the Spirit of God leads you. Regardless of which way you choose, I want you to know that every single prayer, every single share, and every single financial gift is appreciated and really does help me in this ministry. I want to thank you again for your continued support and be blessed.